I came across some written work that Roger had written. And um, I recently got to meet him. And he's one of the best negotiators I've ever met. He's worked in six trade unions. Eight. And um, I, I said to him, have you thought about um, sharing this stuff digitally with other people, like videos, VJ? I was saying to Roger, um, because physically he probably cannot go everywhere, but I said it would be great to video some of your negotiating tips. And um, he has a, he works for um, an organisation called Patients First, and he's been involved with um, some of the work that's come out of Minster. So he's very interested in uh, racism and whistleblowing and the connection between the two areas. Um, and he again, he's another remarkable guy and he has taken the time out of his day as well to be with you, like Eamon. And he's going to um, use, he's been here since about 10 past 11, so he's going to be quite practical with you and speak to you for about half an hour. I'm more embarrassed than they were about it. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, and just to say, um, a bit harmful, that six weeks ago, she bullied me into uh, <laughs> coming here, uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, uh, she did. Um, and I shall tweet about it later on. Um, this little sheet is, um, I'm not going to take through the sheet as such, but um, this is something I sort of scribbled down a couple of nights ago. Um, about things that I suppose I do without thinking um, and some of it is stuff you probably also do without thinking but some, some of this is probably things that it's just what I'd like to just get you to just think about some of the, how you handle situations and although this is about work actually this is also about any situation I Amy mean, I mean, talked about the uh, you know, don't send late night emails it's quite, you quite put it like that but you know, there are all sorts of practical things that you can do. So I want to talk just a teeny bit about those. I want to just throw out one or two tips. And then I thought I'd take three or four of the case studies that came up and just pick something out of them in terms of um, the things I wrote down work on my other sheet of paper to do something about toner and you run into an obstacle. How would you sort of, what's the best way to kind of pick your way um, through that. If you have a poor appointment system, as somebody thinks of you, and you're trying to get people to kind of engage with you, and they don't say no, but they don't say yes, you just can't get them to move. How do you sort of, um, how do you deal with that? Um, ditto if you wanted to, where are you, the, the video man? Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's a mixture of, if you think of the things we bump into, it's Sometimes you get what you want on your terms in the time scale you want, but actually lots of the time you don't. And what I've learned over the years is there's, there's ways of doing it. Some of them are um, things you really need to think about, and other things are things that um, once you see them, you put it. In fact, if you just get another chair, just want to show you something. You got to see each other. The liquid city like this. It doesn't always work, it just makes it easier. And there's lots of little things like that that kind of make a difference. My guess is, as a health visitor, you kind of do some of this. When you walk into a house, my wife's a health visitor, when you walk into a house, you kind of, without thinking, you things like, well, certainly she, she used to, where's the exit? Uh, are there any dogs? What excuse can I use to check if the, you know, what the loo's like? I mean, you do, all, in each of our different jobs, you do some of those things. So what I'm going to talk about briefly is just some of those things. So if you just go through that list, I think the most important thing is in any, in any sort of situation, you know, those little headings at the top, who, what, why, where, when, and how, you can apply those to almost anything. Lots of things Amy was talking about, I'm sure you, in your head, even if you don't consciously write them down, that's what you're doing. And certainly if you're project planning, that's the sort of stuff. 
you do. So if you want something, you've got to think about, you know, what is it? Am I clear what I want? How, what, what's the environment in which I'm doing it? How do I put to get, where's the evidence that what I'm suggesting is daft or off the wall? Uh, and so on. So that's the kind of first thing. You've got to think about, so what is it you want and, and what are the arguments for it? And most of the time you stop there. People don't then go on to the sort of the next stage, which is um, process. So if I'm involved in a disciplinary case or a grievance or a negotiation of some sort, there are issues around you know, workloads. Take your issue of workloads, not just this trust. All trusts in London, but many groups of staff have got you know, the workloads. You can't do what you're expected to do always with the available resources. And there's different ways you can handle that. Um, but um, it's not always easy. And what people tend to do is they focus on, we need more staff, without thinking about, so what's the process by which we're going to, who are we going to raise this to, how are we going to raise it, when are we going to raise it, what evidence have we got, why should they agree, can they agree? In fact, if you kind of... Come on, Joy, can you just come up here for a second? Just pick me. Right. So, let's just imagine. Forget, the, forget it's trust or anything. You want more staff. Why? And um, where's the evidence for that? Because we've got a lot of backlog in the system, which we need to really get right. And how do you know that that's not? So I'm giving you a hard time here, but it's just, <laughs> I just, just to kind of, how do you know that actually it's not really that you need more staff, but you could work better? We don't staff. No, no, but you can do things differently. Like your appointment system. Right. So just changing speed slightly here. So you come to me and you want more staff, and I say, and this is often what I'm really sorry, there's no more money. I'm not going to ask you to respond to that. But can you see how it, it, you need to think ahead, you need to anticipate, um, there might well not be any more money. It might, so if I'm the manager, I might want to say, well, you need to go away and think about that because there's no more money. Or I might say, well, why don't we have a discussion about whether there's better ways we can do some of these things? And if there's really, really no more money, and we've exhausted that, and we can't get any more stuff, we might want to think about, well, actually, maybe we have to stop doing some of the things we're doing, so that the things we do do, we do safely. So, forget the... You can go back to the chat. The, the point is not, not, the issue, not the issue of the workloads, it's... You just need to think about the process. So the, working out what you want is only the first bit of trying to um, uh, trying to get there. Have, has anybody ever been in a, a formal meeting? Not necessarily in this end, not necessarily in Central London Health, but anywhere in a formal. I know, I know you wouldn't be, but has anybody been in a formal meeting where you've gone in and said, "This is what we want." Did anybody, was anybody successful? I'm not really interested in the issue so much, but does anybody feel that we came out of it and we got what we wanted? Yeah. Yes. I think when you negotiate and you understand where the other side's coming from, you can kind of get a better outcome rather than saying, I need this. But if you don't understand that they're not able to deliver this, but if you, under, if you work with their scenario, you're able to get that outcome to a person you found. Very good. I mean, that, that, that's true. And, and so, that doesn't just apply to negotiations. It's when you're writing a letter or an email these days. First thing, apart from, apart from don't ever send a late night email. Always, if you're angry about something, always have another look at it the next morning. That, they're pretty obvious things to do. But the reason for doing that, in part, is because you need to think about what's the impact of this email on the other person. So, in terms of 
I'm not talking about sort of big formal like, union type negotiations, but which we all negotiate in different ways all the time. You negotiate with colleagues. I mean, you see, you know, you see mums down at school negotiating, and, and you can see the mums that came in and started shouting were pretty unsuccessful, and it, because they hadn't worked out better ways of, of getting what they they wanted. Um, let's have the toner example up there. So let's say you've come up with this bright idea and you just can't get anybody interested. What are you going to do? All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, okay. Because <laughs> um, it is a good idea, but. Thank you. Um, I'll probably approach you with a plan as to the kind of consequences or ramifications of implementing a new tone process in terms of cost saving. And if you weren't on board with that, if you weren't real too keen on it, I'd question whether you wanted to make a saving, and I'd reassure you that it isn't something which is going to feed on existing processes. It's something which might interfere with. Something that will result in savings. That's, that, those are the points I'm I think sometimes <coughs> when you do these things, you have to rely. I mean, lots of things get sorted out informally. You, you actually have a negotiation in a corridor or in, or in the reception of the health centre or wherever with people. But sometimes you have to do it more formally. And if I distinguish between um, the substance of the issues, what's the issue about savings from toner? From, from recycling toner, from the process, it's really helpful to think about the two things slightly separately. I mean, on the way here, I took a phone call from a medical consultant who wanted me to represent him. So the first thing, <coughs> two or three questions asked him were nothing to do with what his issue were. It was, um, when's the hearing? When do your papers have to be in? And can you email me your procedure? And then the next question was, can you do me a one-page summary of what you think the issues are? All the rest can follow, but you start in these situations often with, what's the process? Who, who, who are we dealing with? What's the time scale? Etc. It's not that the issues aren't important. But if you're talking informally, you focus on the issues. If you start to hear problems, you need to think about the process. In your case, actually, you were interested in the process. You knew who you had to clear with managers. You had to sort of, I mean, for example, if you've gone ahead without clearing it with a manager, at some point, instead of being patted on the back and saying, oh, that's a great idea, somebody will say, what the hell do you think you're doing? Because there might be governance uh, issues there. The health service can be quite um, bureaucratic about these things. A bit more bureaucratic sometimes. Than it has its advantages over the private sector, but it can sometimes be very process-driven. Um, so you just need to think, you, you need to think, well you did think about process, and if you get stuck on the substance, think about the process as well. So who exactly do you need to persuade? Is there a, tie, a deadline for doing so? Um, how can you, don't send a great big long email, I sometimes represent people, uh, very senior people, I represented a consultant about uh, three or four weeks ago. I said, please send me a, a note. So this 19 page note arrived with paragraphs that were the best part of a page each. And I just said, I I'm not going to read that. You have to send it back. I want numbered paragraphs and so no paragraph more than 10 lines. Because people just don't read that sort of stuff. Even 10 lines of paragraphs is pushing it in my book. But that, you know, that, that will be. So just think about those, um, those practical things. I mean, I've just written down some of the things on emails here. You just want to have a, a quick look. I can't stress how important it is, what it looks like. It's got to be relatively short. I mean, this is not a model of layout, but it's reasonably easy to follow. Roger, do you ever, you know when you're doing your hearing, do you ever advise that there are emails? What, so I, just, uh, what I've been finding recently is that people don't top and tail their emails. 
So rather than saying to you in a student session, I know you've got massive case loads doing really good. So just come in, you're going on three roster A, but I shouldn't miss them. And they just don't contain it and send a message. But that's, I don't know, Colin, but that's your point, because if you don't, if the purpose is to persuade somebody, either by force of argument or, if necessary, kind of force of pressure, um, it, you have to do more than say, this is what I want. That's what my kids used to do. In fact, they still do it. And, and you know, you have to sort of explain, at the very least, I, I'm writing to you, because you are the, what's your job title? Head of Equality and Head of Equality. Right, so you're the Head of Equality. So I'm writing to you, be, Head of Equality, because I understand this is an area that you're responsible for, or because you took the decision, or uh, I'm appealing against the decision that somebody else took. So why am I writing to you? What do I want? Why do I want it? When would I like it by? Am I setting a deadline? It might be a good idea, it might not be a good idea. Here's the evidence as to why it's a good idea, and, and it, these sound quite long, they needn't be very long. Um, and um, I would really appreciate you getting back to me as soon as possible. You know, I, I, I in all my emails, best wishes, even if what, I really want to say something else to them. Um, so, you just need to think, you know, what, what's, what's the, I get stuff and I think, what's the, what's the point of this, what's the purpose? And that's true generally, if you're speaking to people, you get, Speak on the house, speak quietly. My dad had a, a little motto, um, which is actually I discovered many years later, it was pinched from a, a rather dodgy American president, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, but the motto was a rather good one. He said, speak softly, carry big stick. You're much more likely to be listened to if you speak softly, but you clearly have something behind you. The behind you might be just the argument. It might be 50 people who are all saying this has got to stop. It might be some financial pressure or something. But speak softly. If you speak softly and you occasionally have to raise your voice, um, people really sit up and take notice. If you shout all the time, they just switch off. So there's lots of little things. Um, I mean, you know, I sometimes... If you're in a room with somebody, if you're in a room with a manager, come sit here for a second. If, if you're in a room with a manager and the person opposite you, the ma person you're supposed to be persuading, does this, what's that mean? Yeah, it means basically you can solve because I'm not listening and I know it all. And what do you do if that happens? If you want to be just a little bit of fun, try it next time. What would you do? Absolutely. And I tell you, it's real fun. It completely disconcerts them. And they don't even realise why. So, you know those cheap books you can buy at the station about body language? I mean, take them with a pinch of salt, but actually I use them quite a, quite a bit. Um, it's about, what, you know, so the, the little things. So emails are just one way of communicating. Speaking is another way of communicating. Be aware of what you're doing. So, sending emails, what? Assume, always assume, it will be a public document. Always. Never send an email saying it's private, confidential, sod off. Because you can be sure as exit exit is going to come back and bite you. So, so always assume will be yours. Always be polite. Always try and set out a structure that says, this is why I'm writing to you. This is what I'm, this is what I'm after. This is why I'm after it. Here's some evidence if it's there. Um, it might just be a chase-up meeting. You know, we met with you four weeks ago and you were going to send us a minutes. You know, I don't say, where the bloody hell are they? I say, you know, appreciate it. You can please send them to me and let me know when, when you're going to send them by. So, negotiating is, yeah, you see, you see it on television, you know, big pay negotiations or what have you, or big negotiations between you know, David Cameron on the common market, but actually most negotiation isn't like that. It's much, it's more informal, it's more fragmented, but it does, actually if you look at them, they, they use a lot of the same tactics, because it's, it never goes to the same kind of negotiating school, but it's a lot of the same sorts of um, things, so, which, you know, body language and things at the bottom end of things,
but the important things are that you, you, you think about that what, when, um, why, and, and how. Um, supposing, let's set the video man up here. Because this is, um, so with you, this is not far off. Can I, can I ask you, what, what, what pay band do you want to do? Tell me. But it's a disgrace. It is. It is. It's an absolute yeah. disgrace. Um, but that's, that's not why I've got you here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do your paper. Um, but you're in a situation where you've got what looks like a good idea. I'm sure there's some issues around it about cost and practicality and so on. But you've got a good idea. And at the moment, although people are saying, yeah, 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 yeah it's quite likely that, that at least in the short term, you'll get kind of stopped. So, have you thought through how you might, in a way, negotiate your way forward? I think one. You tried to now, James Riley. Oh, well, um, I actually spoke to on that same evening. I did speak to the finance manager, and um, I kind of felt like I was able to go into a bit more depth in why saw was the issue there, and why it feels important to me and kind of the results I'd see after doing certain projects. Um, I did get better feedback from him than I did from James. He was like, you know, if you've got a plan, I'd really like to see it, you know, as soon as possible. Um, so how are you following that up? Because that's a negotiation. Yeah, so then I, yeah, I would email my account to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's so... There's no point in just hey, I've got a plan, I don't know you. But you so you a negotiation can be in you know multifaceted in different sorts of ways. So what I was gonna say if you haven't done it already, and, and the plan should be quite clear. <coughs> and you should follow that who, what, why, where and when. Clear why you're right to begin, you're following up the conversation and so on. Um, good luck with it. Maybe you should do an official aid. Yeah. yeah. Can we just look at, just for a minute, just look at the, the note I've knocked up. We've sort of covered the first bit, uh, the last bullet point in the first bit. So I've sort of separated out, as you can see, the content of the issue from the process. And although I'm talking about this fairly formally, much of this you can do informally. If you're, st if you're standing at the school gates, wanting to persuade a teacher to do something, don't be in their face, dead opposite them. Try and slightly get to the side of them. If necessary, use an excuse and say, look, I'd like you to look at this. It really makes it much easier. I tell you, it... when I first became a trade union negotiator, I uh, it was an healing, almost my first meeting. I wanted to persuade this director of nursing to do something. And she sat down and I sat here. She found the excuse to go to a table and sat there because she must have realised it's harder to for me. So I I went, closed the window and moved the chair around, <laughs> and I got an agreement. So much so that towards the end of the discussion, I sort of very gently put my hand on her arm. I was talking. I said, "Look, you know, we've got an agreement, haven't we?" And she said, um, "All right then." Um, so just think about those sorts of things. Um, Think about process. Don't make it formal if you don't need to. But if you do need to make it a bit more formal, do think about the process as much as you think. Is there a deadline? Who should I speak to? How should I do it? Uh, and so on. Um, I think we touched on some of the. Um, you know, if they, the top of the health, the health service doesn't have a lot of money. So it's very common that the response to things is not a no, it's a, I'm really sorry, but, uh, which is sort of no, or kick it into the long grass. So you need to think about how you might um, find ways to do it. Just as an aside, if you are from a group of people wanting to do something, your team, it's really important that you keep them informed. You write a letter to the manager on behalf of the team, they've got to see it. Preferably, they should see it before you send it. Don't do what I keep seeing, which is people going off. I'm, I'm here on behalf of the health business at XYZ Centre, and then eventually you've, 
you look behind you, and there's nobody there because they didn't. They may not even realise you were there, and it's certainly you did. You know, you've lost that authority. So involve, keeping people involved and, and so on, if it's a group, is really um, important. I mean, I've touched on some practical things there about grammar, spelling. Listen, use spell check. I see letters that come in there. Obviously, typos. It's not bad, sometimes it's bad English, but generally it's typos. Use spell check. It's there to help you. Are we all right on time? Yeah. Uh, another thing. Timing in meetings. Keep an eye on the time. Um, and the great advantage, if I have an informal meeting with you, it is sometimes, let's suppose I'm raising a, a safety issue, a datix report. Datix is simple because it's it automatically records, but you don't raise everything on get datix. There might be something you want to raise in a different way. Your workload issue, for example. Even if you have an informal discussion, it's often appropriate to follow up with a nice email saying, I thought it would be helpful just to confirm what we discussed, what we agreed, what we said. Just sure, then there's a record of it. You don't find yourself six months down the line with, oh no, that isn't what we said. <clears throat> oh yes, it is, because I've got the record here. Don't overdo that, but it's worth, it's worth doing. Um, I mean, I can go on and on, but, but I suppose what I want to emphasize is you need, just as you need to think about what you're going to say, you need to think about how and when and who to. You know, and you are, you know, you're all talented um, and committed people. I think this could, uh, there's a say which is in the room. I mean, this is, you know, this is great stuff because the health service is full of talented people and their talents aren't always used. And, um, you know, I mean, I think it's to the trust credit that they're running such a course because not all trusts, I can tell you, not all trusts run courses like this. Um, but just you need to think about process and, and how you do things, not just what you what you want, on which now I should probably um, shut up. Um. <laughs> do you have the views that, because um, I haven't tried it, but... So I'm standing up because we're hearing, so it doesn't get any older, you think? I read um, a book when my toddler wouldn't do well, which is a couple years old, called Setting Limits for a Strong-Willed Child. And it's about setting choices, so you give them the choices, so you put in the power back onto it. It's meant to work for toddlers. It does, as we figure it out. Um, but if you've got, if you, do you ever go into negotiation and say, well, you've got two choices, you can either um, look at redeploying this person and they're much happier and whatever, or it goes to the front of the and it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands. Yes. Do you ever give that news? So you make the decision, yeah. it's up to you. Yeah. And whether, I, whether I do or not will depend on the situation. I mean, actually, you know, in terms of choices, I mean, it's, it's, you do, yes, you do that in all sorts of ways. So, for example, I'll often say, you yeah, know, if we don't get another two health ministers, we're absolutely stuffed, but actually, we've agreed we'll set up a one. Okay. In terms of choices there, you might give the choices, or you, you should certainly have thought about what might the choices be, so that even if you don't say it, it's quite common if I'm a manager, the manager, I might say, well, you know, what do you want, what do you want us to do? And I think in those situations, um, it's important to be able, how and when you say that, because sometimes it's a bit, of, a bit cagey in terms of who's going to, who's going to open the, you know, the, the specifics of what you want. You need to be clear what you think the way forward might be. So, for example, if there's a breakdown in relations within the team, there's some principles that should guide it, but you might want to be pragmatic. So, for example, if one of the people who's quite upset happens to live near another health centre where there's a vacancy, yeah. that might be a win-win. So even if he or she doesn't want to move, actually they don't mind because it saves them 40 minutes travelling each day. On the other hand, if it was a bullying issue, you have to be quite careful you weren't moving the person being bullied because yeah, as yeah, yeah. an HR person, you, that's, that's not the right thing to do. So you, you would, and, and you might, and similarly, you might, in a workload situation, <coughs> you might, if it's the case the trust has no more money, and if it's the case it's clearly dangerous, yeah. 
I don't know, caseloads are so big, people aren't, aren't able to, to do the job properly. Then there might be a discussion about, so what are we going to drop? And ultimately, I would say, it's for management to say, but a good manager would say, listen, let's have a serious discussion here about what do you think we could possibly, on a temporary basis, drop without, without the minimum risk to the rest of the service. But, but to get to that point, you actually need a bit of trust. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, we should have one of those purposes. If you say, well, if you've got two choices, you either carry on with the existing number of staff you've got, and the service has been delivered, and we lose that, that contract, or we take the risk, and we're carrying on with selling that staff, and we're looking at I think we hope to lose the contract. Well, uh, now you're drawing me into hot water, so I'm going to be kind of a bit careful what I say, but here's one of the areas I'm, I'm, I'm very clear about. Um, the health service, not just but the health service in particular, um, can, is not required to provide all services. In fact, the services the health service is required to provide are very minimal yeah. in, in the absolute requirement. So, if available resources collides with um, what needs to be done, what you can't ask people to do is to not, you can tell people what they, what they can do, but what you can't ask them to do is to work unsafely. And the reason for that, post mid Staffordshire is even clearer, is because of the duty of care that First of all, that the employer has, I know this just think of an example. Let's suppose in the health is I know nothing about health is the service really in, in central London. Let's suppose in the, let's take district nurses and there's any district nurses here? No. District nursing service. Um, and you're saying, you know, we're four down, and the district nurses say, we can't do it. Right? What you can't do is say to them, do your best. Because if it goes wrong, if somebody either dies or there's a serious incident, first of all, the trust will be sued, yeah. quite probably with some success. And individuals have a professional duty of care, regulated ultimately by the Nursing Midwifery Council, the case of the nurses, which doesn't permit them to work in circumstances that are reasonably, I'm going to get a bit legal here, reasonably foreseeably. Yeah, yeah. Unsafe, they don't have to prove they're unsafe, but they, they reasonably unsafe, might be unsafe, um, without raising concerns. So at the end of the day, if you're the district nurse, I can tell you why you should do that rather than that. I can't tell you to do both if it looks pretty unsafe to do it, because that's a betrayal, a breach of your duty of care to the um, duty of care of the individual staff to the people concerned. It's also a breach of the duty of care of the trust, so the trust then opens itself up to a play for negligence if something goes wrong, not to mention the costs of running an inquiry. Sorry, that's a bit of a long-winded, yeah. slightly technical answer, but the essence of it is, no, if finance collides with the needs of patients, Patient. post Francis, the patients come first. And that's you can't what they do have it. a negotiation, that's what they need to yeah. talk about, it's and about it, the risks yeah. of patients. Absolutely, and if you can't do everything safely, you have to reduce what you do, or do yeah. do the work differently. Yeah. <laughs> How do you define yeah. reasonable? Well, I think if you're a health minister, for example, you are likely to know whether on your... I'm picking a new design, I know a lot about health history, but um, you are likely to know um, the point of... the things that you need to do for your caseload. You ought to be able to tell me, if I sat down with you, and you could tell me which of your cases there are, are, a, are a risk, or there might be a lesser risk, but there's still a risk, and which, which families, which children, as far as, as far as it's reasonably possible to know, because you're not, you know, you're not, you haven't rigged them all up with sort of, you know, webcams, so you're not following them, but on the basis of the work, the knowledge and experience of a health, of an ordinarily competent health system, you would be able to tell if you've got a reasonable size caseload, where are the risk, really risky parts of the job, and 
where the other bits are. So some years ago, 20 years ago in Greenwich, we closed all cases, only kept child protection, child protection and at-risk children open, cancelled all clinics. And we, the, the director of nursing went through with the reps and myself. Um, I, you know, I was involved in it. They said, these are the cases that we are not sure about. All the rest of the moment, we're prepared to leave. So the word reasonable, if you're a staff nurse, um, you will also know, maybe quite not, maybe not as much as the rural system, but you will also know what is unsafe and what isn't. Because you will see patients who are being fed, aren't getting water, are getting bed sores, or whatever it is. And you will and, and you in each of your jobs, you will know what you're expected to do and what a reasonable standard of work is. Doesn't mean you have to be the best staff nurse or health visitor or what have you, but you have to work in a way that if we were all health visitors, if you were doing something that was obviously wrong, we would all be saying, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. But if you're doing it okay, isn't that to be the best health visitor in London? Then we would also be able to tell, we could tell, because that's how because we do the job. So peer group. If you like peer group inspection, it's a pretty good guide as long as you will be trained properly. Uh, just a comment really, I think a catch-22 that clinicians have is when things are under-resourced, because we don't want to kind of negatively impact on patients and cancel appointments, mm -hmm. I think you just kind of absorb that slack. And even though we know that we're not doing things the same quality as you might like to, we'd rather be doing it than not doing it at all, with the risk associated with that. And it's quite hard to kind of bring it back to kind of a higher level. We shouldn't be doing this. This is unsafe. Could you just get head down? Okay, just do it. Get on with it. I mean, this is a very good look. It's the health service, and and people, you know, in the staff service, yeah, I said that ninety something percent of the staff, despite all the pressure, say we go the extra mile. If you're an ambulance driver and you're just about to clock off, and the, the work, there's a big road traffic accident two miles down the road, you're and you're asked to go to it because nobody else can go to it, you're not going to say, hey, I'm off home. You're going to go to the accident. If that's happening every day, there aren't enough ambulance drivers. So that there's a kind of, that's the kind of, the, the balance. And, you know, all of you in different ways um, do more than, uh, yeah, I'm, I've never met health service worker yet who's hanging around waiting for work to come in. It doesn't happen. So, so that, that test as to the point at which the first thing you have to do is to say, um, you have to say to somebody in a position of authority, it might be your team leader, it might be your manager, you might want to talk to colleagues first, you might raise it informally, you might raise it formally. We've got a bit of a problem here. So the, the, the ambulance worker, if you're once called out to a road traffic accident and you're working over, yeah, over your hours, that's not necessarily a problem. If you're doing it two or three times a week every week, it's a problem. That's not acceptable. It almost seems like the only way that people might take notice is if, if you don't do that and something awful happens well, that, and somebody goes, oh, okay, let's see. But that's why, that's why I answer the, the trick question at the back there, um, because it's the most important question. I didn't say, don't do it. I said, you need to flag up that it's not possible to do it safely at the moment. So the first thing you might want to do is to have a look at is there are there better ways of doing your appointment system that might enable us with the staffing we've got to be able to do it safely. If there still aren't enough staff, then at some point, if it, if the if what you're describing comes to a point where there's more than a minor risk to patients, there has to be a proper discussion because something has to give. Either they bring in more staff or they change the way you do it, or they stop something you're doing. And hopefully the thing that they stop doing is something that will harm the least number of people. But that's, it's already happening. And in a way, you know, nobody wants to do that. In a way, that, that's what will make, you know, as long as nurses, for example, work longer and longer and longer hours. In Mid-Staffordshire, part of the problem was there weren't enough nurses. The ratio of nurses to skill mix, to healthcare assistants was wrong. It was an accident waiting to happen. People did flag it up, but no one took any notice. But people should have flagged it up more forcefully. Actually, it might have caused some risks at the beginning, 
it would have stopped hundreds of people being killed. I'm sure, I don't have the time. I don't know if that's helpful, but it's, it's, if you if you're really interested, um, I have written a book about this. Is it the one with which one? Did you care? I put your book. The Jujib Care book. Yeah, I put this link. You can put the link up. I've you already want. put it on oh, the Oh, right, agenda. right. Did anybody check these details out before today? Yeah, let's test you on it. Or were you too right. worried about your own presentations? I put Twitter. Do you even know who Roger Klein is? Did you check him up on Google? Yeah, a lot of people doing that. Nobody looked him up. I think, uh, I think your name sounds amazing. He's, so, he's yeah. quite famous. But anyway, it's here. I'll put the link here. It's public world. And actually, what you might find on there, link to that, is a little website that's got things like model letters you can use. And some tips, some of the stuff, quite a lot of stuff I've done here is on there as, um, you can turn it into a video if you want, um, <laughs> on how to conduct yourself in meetings. You know, starting with get there on time. Um, how to conduct yourself in meetings, how to write letters, how to respond to letters, how to follow up letters, how to deal with difficult situations. Um, you know, lo lots of people in my situation sort of hang on to those skills. My view is you should share these so that everybody's got them. Um, but if you go on there, then there's a, it, it's quite a small website, but it's got a load of, and they're all in as Word documents, so you can download them and change them. Any, any more questions for Roger? Okay. Right. Thank you very much.